Welcome to another episode of Bitcoining. I'm your host, Fong Chua, and with me are the two amazing people, Sheen and Chan, who's going to be talking to us about Bitcoin, crypto, investments, stories, all that great stuff. So welcome again to our show. Hi. Hey, Fong. <laughs> how's, uh, how's everything going so far? It's going great. It's going great. Can't complain. Awesome. Well, last time we chatted, uh, you were very, very excited about attending attending the Bitcoin Crypto Rodeo. Uh, what was some of the highlights of that? And uh, please share like some of the up and coming things and some of the interesting things that you saw so far. Um, in a nutshell, it was amazing. Like just the the people that showed up, turned the, the turnout, the crowd, the speakers. Um, very valuable information in so many different areas. Um, a lot of tech that's been happening and a lot of viewpoints. Um, but, you know, almost the same information has been just kind of regurgitated and um, super valuable. I had, you know, some colleagues. Um, one colleague was a realtor. I had invited her and, you know, there was a lot of new things for her. And another colleague who we did real estate investing together, she's kind of been in the space for um, for a while now in the Bitcoin space. So that was pretty cool for her to be in, in town for that. And, and um, I had another fellow colleague, another uh, female colleague. Um, actually, all my colleagues were female. I really wanted to encourage the female community to show up. And, and um, you know, she, someone who I met at the gym and just wanted to, um, you know, get her... To, to get her to be there and just experience kind of what the community was like. So that was kind of cool too. And she was very blown away with the information, like, you know, so yeah, a little thing that I really wanted to, I, I, I was a little bit discouraged on is not enough females, not enough female speakers, not enough female interviewers, not enough female um, networking even. So um you know, that's the only thing I, I would say was kind of a disappointment. So hopefully, um, you know, next year could be a little bit different. But, you know, so next I, year you're speaking on that stage, right? <laughs> hey, I, I would love to actually. That's definitely out of my comfort zone. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to do more speaking. I want to be able to see more female speakers. Totally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, you had you said you, you brought a few uh, guests with you to the thing. Uh, some newcomers, some people like yourself, who's very seasoned in the crypto space and Bitcoin space. What were some of the aha moments for you, who's already been in the space for a few years, and some of the um, shocking elements for newcomers who's never been in that space? I think for me personally, was just trying to learn how to hold Bitcoin in our, our own company's balance sheet. So that was one of the things I really wanted to kind of understand and hear people speak of. And um, so there, there was some moments where it was just like, oh, okay, I didn't know you could do certain things like that. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was very light, really hilarious. And um a lot of the aha moments too was kind of coming from comedian JP Sears. Like he talked about like, you know, a lot of different things, um, you know, just a lot of funny things. You kind of were thinking like, oh my gosh, like I didn't, I didn't think about that. I didn't, you know, but just to keep it not so non-technical and just kind of humorous and funny. Um, I think that was a good segue to, you know, to uh, that that experience in overall. Mm -hmm. So I just like that. I just like how sometimes I get overwhelmed when I go to these meetups or um, spaces when we're talking about Bitcoin that it gets so technical that I'm so intimidated that sometimes I don't really wanna go. And I'll just kind of hide behind my screen and just maybe listen to YouTube videos and see if I can pull little bits of, um, you know, those moments here and there that I can learn. But I think having the comedian, JP, and having, you know, just actually outside of the actual conference, like the networking, the lunches, I think were pretty cool because we had a lunch and we were like 
talking to each other. There was about, I think about eight of us, eight, eight, nine, 10 people there. And um, we were just kind of asking each other questions like, you know, even though whether we were experienced or not, it was like, what, what fact do you know about Bitcoin? And it was just kind of a round table discussion over lunch. And then after the conference, the two day conference, we actually went to an after party. So I thought that was actually a lot of fun and meeting a lot of good people and just networking there and actually, you know, doing sort of business, you know, transactions, conversations there. Um, so yeah, I thought that was that was a pretty cool part. Nice. Now these kind of events happen either once a year or every so so many months or something like that. That people get together and talk about Bitcoin, talk about crypto, the industry, uh, all that stuff. Uh, having those like-minded individuals in the same room. Now, what is your recommendation for people who one have no experience at all? Who what can they do to prep for something like this, or what? Or even if they should prep for something like this. <laughs> Thanks, Fong. I, I don't know how much they can prep other than for someone totally new, never been in this space. Um, I would say, hey, you know, just, just show up. Just show up and start networking with people and talking to people, going to your local Bitcoin community events. Join the OPA um, app, which is, it stands for Orange Pill app. And it's a global community of like-minded individuals in the Bitcoin space. And then we also branch out into um, micro spaces like Bitcoin for women in the app itself. And then there's like, you know, it could be whatever you're interested in. Is it, it they have a um, dedicated channel for, you know, just discussions. And then I think what's going to happen is they're going to have some sort of ambassadors for each city in the world. Like say, because Sheen and I are from the Calgary area. So there's going to be a few ambassadors that's going to be helping launch. Like if people were to come into a city, show them around the city, show them where to go for Bitcoin events, for discussions, for meetups, for just kind of having coffee and talking about Bitcoin in general. Um, so I think that's for someone new, that's probably where they can get started. And once they join these little groups, they're going to be like, well, how do I get Bitcoin and how do I accept Bitcoin? And that's kind of the discussion that would take along their journey. And they might get a little bit of Satoshis. And now in their wallet, they've got a little bit of Satoshis and they're kind of got some skin in the game. Now they can feel like, you know what, I have, you know, a little bit and I feel like I want to learn more or what mistakes do I need to learn in order to keep it and security issues and all that. So I think it just gets you down that rabbit hole mm. to start. Very, very awesome. The, every time you mention Satoshi's, I, I keep on thinking that uh, out of all the vocabulary my, my four-year-old has, Satoshi's is one of them. And she now associates Satoshi's with Auntie Chan. So uh, you're, you've branded yourself with her. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love um, it. Sheen, I know you you weren't able to get to the, the rodeo, uh, but you've been to a lot of these events and a lot of these conferences yourselves. What do you think is the most important aspect of people attending these things? Like if they're wishing, wishy-washy about whether going or not, what's the biggest advantage that you found for either a newcomer to go to an event like that? I think sometimes it's the energy, the, you know, the passion that other people have. For this kind of thing and sometimes in your day-to-day -day life you kind of forget about um you know why you're investing in certain things why you're trying to do what, what you're trying to plan for in the future and uh, these people just kind of bring it back to you and those kind of talks and speeches you see how excited people are about bitcoin and, and you realize there's there's so much room to grow in this space that it's brand new that uh, kind of puts you back on track and mm -hmm. i think that's a good way to go for people is uh if you're brand new and you don't know why, like, why are people so interested in Bitcoin? Why are people so passionate about it? Is the Bitcoin community all just a bunch of weirdos who uh, live off the grid and <laughs> don't interact socially with anybody else? Um, there are those people, yes. Some. But <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of cool, normal people too that are, are looking for a different way of life and a different um, way around the current financial mess that the world seems to be in. And it's interesting that we're doing this podcast today of all days as the markets seem to be crashing around us. And everyone's looking for a narrative or a reason 
why it's happening. And uh, we may leave another topic, but the crazy thing that I was just reading, I was looking to see if this was true, is uh, everybody remembers the 2008 financial crash sorry, that happened. But a lot of people probably don't remember the exact dates. In August of 2007, it was almost identical to today. You know, the market had ran up however many percent over the last uh, couple of years. Real estate was booming in the States. And in August of 2007, there was a flash crash, a 10% drop in the market, just like there has been in this August. And at that time, they were calling for rate cuts. They were saying, oh, we need to have an emergency rate cut meeting to drop the interest rates in the United States. Other countries had already started dropping their interest rates. And the market actually rallied. So I don't know if that's going to happen again this time up until about October 2007. And that's when the real financial crashes started and the banks in the United States started bailing. And from that point, the market dropped 60%. So is that what is going to happen again? Is history actually not just rhyming, it's actually repeating this time? Uh, I guess in a few months, time will tell. But it's uh, eerily scary how similar the market right now is to back in 2007. So, you know, these kind of things, it's good to kind of stay informed and, and know what's going on. And people um, will always say they didn't see it coming when it, after it happens because uh, <laughs> they're just not watching. And uh, maybe now is the time to watch and see what's going to happen over the next few months. <laughs> 2007 is when, when I started to get into the space of investing and starting to grow that mindset of, okay, what do I do outside of your day-to-day -day job and finding out more about real estate, investing businesses and all that kind of stuff. And I think two or three years after that, I, I met the two of you. So maybe it, if history repeats itself, I'm going to have to do that all over again. I'm going to meet another Sheen and Chad <laughs> to teach me everything I need to know. <laughs> well, that was the where the Bitcoin spawned from was after the financial crisis, right? So you know, times of crisis do bring out important innovations and ideas, and it's an opportunity. It's also a tough time for a lot of people who aren't prepared. So maybe it's time to start getting a little bit prepared for, for things to be changing over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So back in 2007, uh, the crypto space was not as big as it is now. Uh, so now that the crypto space has been introduced into the world, how has the market being the way it is right now affect how people should look at crypto? Uh, well, crypto is still seen as a risk asset, right? So in every crash, people kind of abandon the, the tech and innovation world for the reason that it's seen as risky. A lot of the, the tech companies don't make a huge profit and they're driven by you know investing profits into R&D to build a future product or service that will make a lot of money. So in good times, tech does well because there's a lot of money flowing in. In recessionary times, that money dries up and tech suffers. So in the crypto world, there will be a huge decrease in a lot of the altcoins, which don't you know, produce a lot of value. People are speculating in. I guess speculation is, is also the big that dries up. Everyone jumps out of anything that they're speculating in, including real estate, <laughs> and look for safe assets such as gold. So Bitcoin isn't quite big enough to be called a safe asset yet, but that could change. So that's one of the you know future world things. When a crash happens, sort of everything drops, including gold. But usually the safe assets are the ones that recover the fastest first. And then people want to see, is, like everyone right now is looking for a narrative, like why did the market crash? And the current thesis is that, you know, Japan stock market crashed first, and that's bringing the rest of the world down with it. Um, so if people leave that narrative, they believe, okay, it was just only Japan, everyone else is okay. Maybe the markets rally back up. And then what is the big trigger? Is it an American bank? Like it was in 2007. Is it real estate again? Is it commercial real estate? Uh, I think gold will do well if this is the case and we are going into recession. Um, and Bitcoin could do well if people see it as a safe asset, but I think people still look at crypto as a whole as as fairly risky in a, in a tech world that could change you know five ten years from now but at the moment that's where bitcoin stands mm -hmm. well now uh chan you mentioned that you brought a few people with you to that rodeo uh with the conference and all that kind of stuff with Bit bitcoin and some of those people that you brought are brand new to that space 
they don't have much concept of how to invest, where to invest, why to invest, and all that kind of stuff. Having been through the 2007 time and with what you know now, how do you how do you talk to people like like those people who have zero concept of investing as to what they should do or should not do or how they should have their minds uh, in that space so that they're more prepared? I'm not sure about what I would tell them as much as what I would do myself and hopefully my actions will speak louder than my words. Um, because I remember in 2007 and um, I, you know, I had properties out in, um, in Calgary and sold some in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon to be, uh, to be specific. And then I actually speculated in a brand new condo out in um, Vancouver on Richard Street. Um, so like when 2007 happened right before the financial crash, it was just like, oh my gosh, that property I speculated in, I, it was a big learning lesson. And um, of course, didn't make money, but all my other properties in uh, my rental properties was were still cash flowing. Like things didn't change, and you know, the numbers still made sense for those ones. And I still had some cash, um, positive cash flow. Um, but I still think like if you had a strategy, especially with real estate, like it doesn't matter if the market's up, down, or sideways like you have to have an exit strategy and it's exit strategies could be the short-term strategy or the long-term, like the, our buy, rent and holds are the long-term strategies. So no matter what the market does, it still has to make sense. So when things are falling, like right now, where the, it's like the sky is falling, everyone's scared because of Bitcoin prices are falling. Like to me, that's just distraction. I don't even, I mean, it's hard. It's easy to say, don't it, just ignore it. Of course, it's still scary internally, and I, I get it. But at the same time, you got to hold your ground. Like, I still believe, like, the fundamentals, the foundation of what Bitcoin can do, that is the most important. And you kind of have to have a gut check, internal check, that you're going to stay in it for the long term. Mm -hmm. And um, no matter what, I feel like the news is almost pressuring me to sell off my Bitcoins. And I, I really don't want to do that. And I... And I think a lot of people are feeling that way. Like, hey, are we, is it, can we just get ahead by selling it now and just recovering? And honestly, like, I just feel like, just like real estate investing, the scarier people are, the better the opportunities. And I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines, you know, taking a breath and just being like, okay, I'm waiting for the opportunities to come. And I'm, I'm actually really excited. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is very rare for people to go, hmm, market's coming down. I'm very excited. So for for Sheen, imagine yourself, let's say, 20 years older. What would you do knowing what you know now? And imagine yourself 20 years younger. What would you do knowing what you don't know now? What would be the contrast in your actions uh, with what's happening in the market right now? If you've been in the market for the past say, three or four days and you haven't gotten out yet, <clears throat> it is is a tough decision, to be honest, because you don't know if it's going to go down or up from here. It could go either way. Now, markets are markets. Uh, when risk happens, typically the downside drop is faster than the upside climb. So we've already had a huge drop. Could it drop more? Yes. Could it bounce back up? Yes. Um People that have been trading in the markets might have been able to get in and out, but people with a long-term view um, probably just realized that their portfolios are down, you know, 10 or 15% today. So what do you do from here? If if you have a long-term look going forward and you're, you're, I was, you know, close to retirement, I would hopefully not be in as risky assets that, <laughs> that have dropped. And I would look and say, well, you know, I can get four to 5% on in the bond market. I can maybe buy some gold and that'll probably hold this value or go up. And maybe I shouldn't be in the S&P or NASDAQ or, or Bitcoin for that matter, um, because I have a short term horizon. So you could take less chances. If I was 20 years younger and I was risky and say everything dropped and you had some cash sitting on the sideline, maybe it could be the time to invest and you could hope for the fast recovery. 
but you have to understand that there's risk either way. Um, right now, there seems to be more risk to the downside than the upside, but that could change. It, it's just, uh, it's too chaotic. If people are in the position, the same thing with any investment, whether it be real estate or stocks, Bitcoin, if you're in a position where if the market goes down, you get into trouble and you get forced to have to sell, you probably shouldn't be in the market right now. <laughs> So if you have a longer term horizon, like Chan said, and and you're looking for what's going to happen 5, 10, 15 years out, you can weather the storm either way. You can sit on the sidelines. Um, I think that's what's, you know, we tie this into real estate. A lot of people are, are wondering, well, will the real estate market change in Calgary and Edmonton? Edmonton seems to be booming a little bit more than Calgary even right now. Calgary seems to be having a little bit of a slowdown. And people are wondering, is this a slowdown to the crash? What will change, what I kind of would watch, is the the rental market. And the rental market in Calgary peaked this year. Um, it, it hasn't been increasing like it did last year. And that's sort of a sign of a slowdown. Even if you take the narrative of everyone's moving from Toronto and Vancouver to Alberta, and they want to you know buy a house in Alberta, and then the rental market is going to be booming, and immigration is high, why did rents not go up this year? And, and you know, Pretty lots of answers. It could be that um, you know people in Vancouver, Toronto were buying rental properties or properties that they could rent out, and the inventory in Calgary has gone up. That's partially true. I mean, houses if their price rates still sell really fast, so we're in that that weird point. Like, what's going to happen next? And I don't think it's going to be the Alberta market that causes real estate to crash. I think it's going to be the global market. And if you look at you know big term recession in the United States. Oil prices go down, which isn't good for Alberta. Big slowdown in Canada in terms of producing things. Job market slows down, and then people get scared. And then the people that speculate on real estate are the ones that have to bail out. And that's what drives the market down. The people that have been living in their house for years and are going to be continue to live in the same house for years probably don't care what the price of their houses is as much. I mean, when things are up, it seems good. When things are down, it seems bad. But they're living their lives normally. It's the people that speculate on real estate and say, well, you know what? If I buy this property now for eight hundred thousand dollars, I rent it out for negative fifteen hundred dollars a month cash flow. If I can hold on to it, when it starts going down in price as well, it's losing money every month. Hmm. And then those people maybe you know lose a job or get in trouble in other places, then they have to sell. And that's what forces markets up and down really quickly, or more down in that case, very quickly. So you don't want to be in a position where you're speculating and you have to sell. That's the worst place to be in. So if you're speculating and you don't have to sell for the next 10 years, 10 years from now, you probably don't even care what happened. But if you have to speculate and you know you need that money in the next six months or a year, then dangerous times ahead, I guess. Well, one thing that you mentioned a few times is investing job market and how things go up and down, there's risk and whatnot. The thing is, there's a lot of people out there who are so uh, against the concept of investing. Well, not against, but like the whole mindset of how to invest and putting the time into mm -hmm. earning more. So they they kind of ditch all that stuff to a specialist or uh, RSPs or the bank or something like that. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm good. Yet they, they're not really thinking long term and what may happen if things go down? They're not really thinking about uh, the job market, which could go down and could affect them, which then affects everything else. Uh, Chan, I know you speak with a lot of people with within your your uh, your your sphere of influence, where you're talking to people of all different ages, all different backgrounds, and I'm sure a lot of them have lots of stories that go, "Well, there's this happening and that happening, and I don't know what to do." What are some of the things or most common stories that you hear? that could be solved with a mindset of, okay, investing, putting your time into education, education and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I do talk from different walks of life, whether they're in the early 20s to the late 60s, you know, whether it's our grandparents and mother-in-law even, and uh, it's got someone else, you know, taking care of her money, or to someone in the, you know, the early 20s, you know, getting their degree, getting into the workforce and starting their career and saving for their down payment for a home, because that is what society teaches them to do. Um, they are, you know, wrapped up in this notion that you have to own property or you need to buy a home 
and they don't know any other strategies as other than what society has taught them. And so they're getting to the point where it's like their dollar has not stretched that much. They're, they're, they're trying to buy groceries. They're trying to make rent. They're trying to save for the future and they might need one or two other side gigs just to survive. Like that is um, like, it's more common now. So it is almost um, like they don't know the scenario. They don't, they don't know the wheel that they're going around. And so sometimes when we have these conversations that it's just like, you know, there are different ways, different strategies, whether it's real estate for the purpose of getting cash flow or there's Bitcoin, it becomes very uh, cumbersome for them. So some of the conversations are, are pretty cool because like I get to know kind of how the new generations are living and it's just like, oh my gosh, like they're not even being taught in the basic conversations or basic educations in school about money. So it just comes down to kind of learning the history of money even like what Nixon did, taking off like the, you know, the, the gold from the dollar, like back in 1971, uh, reading certain books like, you know, Building Wealth with Russ Whitney, Rich Dad Poor Dad with Robbie Kiyosaki and just learning about assets and liabilities. And just having those like upfront conversations are like mind -bog boggling for these, you know, um, these people because they don't really know anything about money. And, but they've been taught, like, it is important to have it. Uh, and, but they don't know that they should be acquiring assets, like assets that actually make money. And knowing that if they do buy a property to live in, that they're buying a liability because they're losing money. And so it just, that's how it starts. And I just, I see that pattern. And for me, that's why we, Sheen and I, we want to break that pattern for our children. Um, early and learning that, hey, in a conversation, we can talk about money, learning that we could just talk about Bitcoin and that it's not scary, that, you know, this is this can be a normal conversation. So I just think there should be more conversations like that out there um, for the parents to talk to their kids about Bitcoin and real estate and investing and just doing it differently other than going to school, getting a degree. There's nothing wrong with that, right, Sheen? Because you, you know, you, you've got your, you guys have your engineering degrees, and that's worthwhile. But there are different ways to learn now, and different ways to get ahead. And I think the foundation is learning about money. You mentioned how parents should start talking to their kids a lot more about the financial, like their financial future, how to be more strategic with finances, having that literacy. The biggest problem is a lot of parents are afraid to jump into it themselves. Uh, that fear is stopping them from having that mindset. Uh, so my question, Sheen, is how do you overcome that fear? What's the best way of kind of jumping over that hurdle of fear in the vest thing and at least dipping your toes into it? I think people think it's an all or nothing game where you have to put all of your money into one place. And if it goes up, you win. If it goes down, you lose. It doesn't have to be that way. I think just putting a little bit in and it's a learning process. Understand that you're going to make mistakes. And you're going to be wrong. Um, probably just as many times as you're, as you're right. It's like, <laughs> what's this? It's almost 50 50. Could it go up? Could it go down? It could go either way. Could it go sideways? Sure. Um, but it's the education part of it. And having some skin in the game makes you want to get educated. If you want to just throw your money in something and do the hope, wish, and pray strategy, it may work out. And in most cases, it probably won't. Most people who try to trade, uh, markets and beat the experts in these areas probably end up losing. And Bitcoin is the, you know, one technological advancement that the average person has had an advantage in over the, you know, wealthy hedge fund managers and, and corporations out there in the world. It's something that you can put money into for the long term and you haven't had to um, do anything too crazy trading it or doing anything speculative to to own it and hold on to it and no one else has to control it. You don't lose money by holding Bitcoin in your cold storage. You don't have to pay a fund advisor to manage it for you. Um, you can just buy it, hold it and and wait and see because uh, I think over the next 10 years, it has a very bright future. Could it go to zero? Possibly. That's the risk. So I don't say people have to put every single penny into any single asset that they don't understand. I think that's very bad, but it's the 
the same thing is like, I guess you could kind of put the analogy of watching sports. You know, people have some money invested in it, whether betting or whatever it is. It makes them the, the, they want to know more about the sport, watch it more carefully. They're more excited about it. They get into it. That's sort of the approach to finances I think people can take. Put a little bit of money in. Don't put all your money in. Keep some money in your bank account, whatever you want to do. But having a little bit of money in and wanting to learn will push you to the next level. And that's what gets that's what gets the the world a better place when people start understanding that a little bit more about these these financial methods and ways to get ahead. And I think that is good for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest complaints people have is, you know, hey, I don't understand Bitcoin, so I don't want to get into it. But they're, they're happy to throw their money into the S&P and why is it going up and down? I don't know. <laughs> is this because someone told me to do it? <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. You're right, Sheen. Like, I, I keep it pretty simple. Like, I mean, with our family and for the, our kids, it's just kind of like having a savings account and a checking account and Bitcoin Satoshis even um, or allocating a little bit just to buy some Satoshis and keeping it in a savings account. Like, you know, if you don't, I don't care what the market's doing with Bitcoin. It's, it's going up, down, like just to keep accumulating a little bit. You're not going to put your whole paycheck into the savings account. You need that to live and spend, but allocate, you know, like a percentage of 1% of that. And that just gets started and just do that consistently. Like our society these days are not teaching our kids, people in general to make mistakes, like to fail and that resilience so how you build resilience is just like you got to learn and you got to fail you got to keep learning from those failures and i don't think we've been um exposed to that enough because it just seems like we fail we don't want to it's either like what she said all or nothing like okay this doesn't work i won't do it but the question should be like how do we make it work how do we you know learn more and that's kind of the path that we took with real estate investing and now the path with Bitcoin as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is like, how many mistakes have you made? Like <laughs> talk about that because that's where I think people can succeed and find innovation as well. And um, yeah. Totally, totally agree with both of you. Um, going back to 2007, uh, when, when I first started in all this kind of stuff, I, I I didn't learn anything about gold, silver, don't have that much interest in really reading about it and all that kind of stuff. However, it was an easy way of starting. So every two weeks, you get your paycheck, you buy two or three ounces of silver. And then all of a sudden, you go, huh, I wonder how much, is, how much it is today. Oh, let me read up on that. And all of a sudden, that interest comes to you. I kind of took the same approach with uh, Bitcoins and, and cryptos. Like, okay, let's have some. I'm not going to put thousands and thousands of dollars into it. Have maybe a couple thousand and then see what happens. And then all of a sudden, oh, what, what's the price of it today? Oh, what's the price of it today? And then if I have any questions, I call the two of you and go, hey, what's going on? So yeah. <laughs> you start expanding your your willingness to learn, uh, which is, which really just starts off with just one, right? One piece of silver, one piece of gold, whatever it is, one uh, one little bit of, of Bitcoin or, or crypto. Uh, so totally agree with both of you as to how people should start uh, when it comes to investing and opening up that mindset. Um, what is your what's the forecast what do you expect to happen what's the crystal ball talking about right now <laughs> <laughs> in terms of things going up and down my i guess if we're, well, right now like i said it's 50 50 if it could go up or down we could continue a downward trend but i don't think the reasons for why things crashed justify everyone panicking at the moment and i think there will be a bit of a recovery in the short term um and then the way that the financial markets are looking around most of the Western world are not good. And I think we could be going into a longer term recession over the next, you know, two to four years. Um, some analysts are saying it's going to be the worst. It's going to be in a, like a depression level event and we're going to be suffering. I think there's going to be more money printing coming. Uh, some sort of quantitative easing are all around the world. Countries are going to get into more and more debt. I don't know if this is the time that it gets so bad that the reset happens. Everyone's been talking about this great reset. There could be a new financial product that comes out to replace dollars, you know, within our lifetime for sure. Um, I don't think our debt is sustainable. So those are all doom and gloom things. Um, opportunity wise, I think the assets such as gold and or Bitcoin, gold has already been talked about as being a, a reserve 
for a new dollar, like the BRICS dollar possibility. And people have hinted that maybe Bitcoin could be doing the same thing. So I think people are going to get a lesson in money one way or the other very soon. Either your money is going to be devalued to be worth very little, and you're going to hopefully have some assets that go along with the increase in dollars that are going to be out there, or you're going to be left behind. <laughs> so hopefully people listening to this will jump on the buy some assets. Like you said, buy some silver. If you if you want a hard asset that is, you know, not going to break the bank because you're only spending, you know, less than 40, 50 bucks to, to buy an ounce of silver, that's a good way to go. If you want to get a little more creative and learn about a new technology, buy some Bitcoin. Those two things will be very valuable if the world gets as tumultuous as it seems to be getting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Well, any other comments or final thoughts that either one of you have? This is the day to get started. Ladies, females, <laughs> some stats. Yeah, we need more females to go up on there, that stage to speak. So start now, get good, and go up on that stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Yeah, thanks, Bob. We're good. Awesome. Well, I uh, will see you in a couple of weeks. And remember, uh, that's Chen, Sheen. And until next time, when you're Bitcoining, you're shaping tomorrow's economy. We'll see you later. See you.